I'm going to resume our discussion of goiter nodules and tumors, picking up where we left off at thyroid malignancies. So there are basically four tumors you need to know. That's it. If you can only remember one, please focus on papillary carcinoma, seeing how it is most common and has unique and fun pathology features. Unique makes them great fodder for the NBME. Thyroid cancer questions should be total gifts. There aren't too many ways for the NBME to mess these up. In fact, I'd say half the thyroid questions are on hyper-hypo function. The other half reside with malignancies. They really are gifts. You don't want to miss these. So set up a slide or a table or a piece of scrap paper. You can scribble this on your hand on test day, but make sure you get these. So write down papillary and write down follicular. Now write down anaplastic. Now write down medullary. There are your four tumors. When you see medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, you need to automatically think of the MEN syndromes and specifically 2A and 2B. MEN2 syndromes are both characterized by the presence of medullary thyroid carcinoma and pheochromocytoma. We'll cover medullary thyroid carcinoma here and MEN in the adrenal section. So let's take medullary off the list because it is unique and will be buried in MEN questions. Let's look at anaplastic. Anaplastic is rarely the primary focus of a question. The pathologic features, however, are quite characteristic and most often appear as a distractor. So what is the hallmark pathologic feature? Here it is, my friends, the osteoclast-like multinucleate giant cell. That's the player. Osteoclast-like multinucleate giant cell. Remember when I mentioned the giant cell granulomatous thyroiditis? Well, here's the other presentation of giant cells in the thyroid disorders. We'll talk about this shortly. So that brings us to papillary and follicular. Here's what you need to know. The first point, who is at risk? This isn't subtle, and they do include the information in the question step. Papillary carcinoma is related to radiation exposure. Remember we mentioned giving potassium iodide following nuclear accidents? It was to prevent papillary carcinoma. Follicular is related to iodine deficiency. I won't torment you again with the trophic hormone story, but chronic exposure to growth factors such as TSH is a risk factor for neoplasm. The other key distinguishing point besides the pathologic description, is the pattern of spread. This is another fun little toy they like to play with. So papillary carcinoma spreads regionally, follicular spreads hematogenously. The classic question will be a patient from the Ukraine who lived in Chernobyl 30 years ago during the meltdown. They have a solid, non-functioning nodule. A lymph node is palpated in the neck. Then they ask the derivative pathology question. Chernobyl and lymphadenopathy equals papillary carcinoma. As for the hematogenous spread of follicular carcinoma, we'll cover this in a moment, but follicular carcinoma is characterized by capsular invasion compared with follicular adenoma. Just picture that capsular invasion as taking place into a blood vessel and spreading distantly. And that brings us to the key final point. What are the pathologic descriptions? If you know these, we're done, and you'll crush thyroid on the boards. So here goes. Papillary carcinoma is associated with ionized radiation. It may be multifocal. This isn't important other than to compare to follicular, which is, like the adenoma, solitary. But here is the money, the pathologic descriptors. Branching papillae on fibrovascular stalks also referred to as fronds or finger-like projections. And here's the tricky one, somoma bodies. Somoma bodies are noted, and that's great, and you guys are smart, and everybody knows that, but be prepared to have them described by other tricky little names, such as dystrophic calcification, calcific spherules, etc. Don't be sitting around waiting for the word somoma. That only happens in fairy tales and pathoma. Just kidding. The other key pathologic features are the nucleus descriptors. Finely dispersed chromatin that appears empty is described as orphan Annie eyes. That's great and characteristic, but I've never seen this targeted as a question. Instead, they go after the more subtle and overlooked 
intranuclear grooves. Did you hear that? They know you are focused on some OMA bodies, and they know orphan anti eyes are adorable. So instead, they catch you napping on these intranuclear grooves. Now, to be fair to the NBME, they do give you the other bells and whistles, such as radiation exposure and regional lymphadenopathy. So you can still sort it out without the grooves, but do be aware of this pathologic description in papillary carcinoma. Everything I just said is summarized on this pathology slide. Be familiar with it. It is the language of papillary carcinoma. Clinically, these patients present with a mass that may be locally invasive. It might be described with compressive effects. Diagnostically, these masses or nodules will be described on ultrasound as hypoechoic, reflecting the solid nodule. That is, the echo sound waves don't penetrate solid tissue. Radioactive iodide uptake would reveal a cold or hypofunctioning nodule. A fine needle aspirate would be obtained. This is the malignancy where they will offer FNA results because they are characteristic, as we just reviewed. As for treatment, surgical excision followed by I-131 therapy with serial monitoring by thyroglobulin level. Boom, that's papillary carcinoma. Next couple slides are just pathology quiz questions for you to do on your own. I must have been a little manic while composing this section. Here are the questions, and the next slide shows the answers. Did you get all the answers? It was like an Anki deck with one card. Who's the coolest? Let's move on to follicular carcinoma. We already hit the highlights. It is associated with iodide deficiency, and like an adenoma, presents as a solitary lesion. It is associated with a KRAS mutation, which is a gain-of-function mutation leading to unregulated cellular proliferation. As for the pathology, it is interesting in its relative normalcy. Sheets of uniform cells with scant follicle remnants. The diagnostic feature is capsular invasion. Hurdle cells may also be present. You are going to nail this one not by what they tell you, rather by what they don't tell you. There are no striking features such as intranuclear grooves, no somoma bodies or calcific spherules. There really isn't anything juicy here. If I'm the NBME, I'd rather ask you papillary carcinoma questions. They are more fun. So here it is. Capsular invasion, in my mind, is synonymous with hematogenous spread. Treatment is similar to ca uh, papillary carcinoma, including excision, administration of radioactive I-131, and serial monitoring with thyroglobulin levels. Here is a path summary for what is present and what is not present. Pay attention to the image only insofar as envisioning the invasion and hematogenous pattern of spread. And here is just another imaging highlighting the distinction between a follicular adenoma and carcinoma. It's this, capsular invasion. So we're winding down here, folks. Here is anaplastic, and as I mentioned previously, be familiar with the pathologic description. This is kind of like Rydell's thyroiditis in the sense it is more apt to be a pathology distractor rather than a specific question target. So this is a nasty player. 100% mortality. That's not good. It is seen in older adults, and we'll see why that's important in a second. Pathogenesis reflects de-differentiation, which simply means that it takes something bad and makes it worse. That is, the tumor is thought to devolve from more benign malignancies such as papillary or follicular. So here is the money, the pathology description. Two types and phrases to be familiar with. Pleomorphic giant cells with occasional osteoclast-like multinucleate giant cells. That's nasty and a mouthful. They may also be described by spindle cells, which are sarcoma-like. You need not frankly memorize these, but do be familiar with the descriptors so you don't pick the wrong answer on a more innocent papillary carcinoma question. This slide includes a graphic representation of de-differentiation, highlighting the process in developing anaplastic carcinoma. Here also is an H&E representation of that pleomorphic giant cell. I did mention that the giant cell can also be seen in granulomatous thyroiditis. The patient with granulomatous or viral thyroiditis is younger and presents with a tender enlarged gland. They will also be acutely hyperthyroid. In anaplastic carcinoma, the patient is older and presents with a palpable non-tender neck mass. There shouldn't be any confusion between the two. And finally, medullary thyroid carcinoma. 
This is a neuroendocrine neoplasm derived from parafollicular C cells. The C cells are calcitonin producing. Medullary thyroid carcinoma is almost always discussed in the context of MEN syndromes. What does that mean? They'll give a pathologic description of medullary thyroid carcinoma and ask you to choose or decide what other symptoms the dude may have. The answer will be some derivative of pheochromocytoma, such as headache or hypertension. In terms of pathogenesis, please note the activating mutation of the RET proto-oncogene. The mutation is associated with a loss of cell cycle regulation. This piece of information is often included in the question stem. As for the pathology, there is an amyloid-like appearance that results from synthesis and secretion of calcitonin. Remember, amyloid essentially represents overproduction and abnormal folding of proteins. You will need to be familiar with different amyloid proteins. I do hate this term, but it is high yield. So do know the amyloid protein in medullary thyroid carcinoma. The amyloid is composed of calcitonin. Coming back to pathology, of course they don't say amyloid was present. They describe it by Congo red staining with apple green birefringence when, re when viewed under a polarizing lens. If they mention Congo red stain in any discussion of thyroid, they are telling you medullary thyroid carcinoma. That is the language of this tumor. Here I include a pathology slide, mostly to emphasize the infiltrative appearance of amyloid. What did Sachs just say? Infiltrative? That's right. So in the kidney, it is infiltrative, especially in the mesangium, causing proteinuria. In the heart, it is infiltrative, causing restrictive heart disease. And so it goes in the thyroid, an infiltrative appearance. The only other kicker is treatment. They might describe a patient with pheochromocytoma and ask you to choose the next step in management. One of your answers might be prophylactic thyroidectomy. That is, they're backing you in to an MEN syndrome. In terms of monitoring, these tumors do elaborate calcitonin. That's neat. It gives us something to measure during serial monitoring. Calcitonin levels are monitored in the patient with medullary thyroid carcinoma. Believe it or not, we're done with goiter, nodules, and thyroid cancers. Please, please, please be familiar with the pathologic descriptors reviewed in this section. Thyroid pathology should really be money in the bank. And, dear kind people, that concludes our review of the thyroid gland for USMLE Step 1. Contact me if you have any questions or concerns.